morning in whatever you would have me to say in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ I pray amen and amen you can be seated at this time Praise the Lord. How many enjoyed Brother Mim? He's done a wonderful yeah. job. Praise the Lord. So that secret place is a wonderful place to be. But in that secret place, then the Lord should be speaking something that he's doing in this hour as well, too. And he preached uh, down in Alabama uh, concerning that types and shadows and and typing things is fine, but he says it's time for the bride to move on. And I thought, well, maybe he might have been listening to hear the Moncton, but when he got here, he didn't even know where our site was. So, so the Lord is, sh is showing him that there's a need to move on with the Lord in the time we live in. Also at this time, uh, maybe not so much what you see on, on the screen there, but in the Far East, it could be a beginning of God changing the climax, or the climate, if you want to. Because somewhere we know that the kings of the East is going to do battle with the Antichrist system, the beast, in the week of Daniel. And it can't remain in the shape or form that it's there now. I believe God's allowing this man Trump to maybe give it the initial start. Whether We don't know whether it will go to war or whatever take place there. But somehow God is, seems to put, be putting pressure that there has to be a change in the Far East. Because it can't remain like that with America being the power she is and controlling things in that time frame. So that's one thing for sure. And the things that are taking place all over the world, actually started with Brexit. How that the average person, the, well, well, yeah, the average person, I guess, is dissatisfied with the way the governments are running things. And it's the rich that want to control things and just let the people, there. that could work for a while while the people was not being hampered too much. But now when the middle class is starting to struggle, it's not just in Britain, not just in America. Actually, there, I, there was about when Trump got elected not too far after that, there was a reporter put out an article saying that all of the European uh, countries, they have elections every, two, every four years or so but they're all coming up within the next couple of years. And their rating is all under 50%. The people are dissatisfied with their choice, with what's going on. So it's just showing that God is allowing the pot to heat up so when the time is right, even Europe needs to be, have a change. They have to be together, have to have a rapid force. Uh, when Trump said these, if you don't pay up, uh, we're gonna maybe not defend you. And so it's, for, it's causing pressure for Europe to get in line. Do what the Bible says. Now, Trump's not doing it because he read the Bible. But it's pushing there. The, as far as the Middle East, well, since the Arab Spring, it's been going through different countries, touching it, getting things ready. And there, too, the people, if you want to want some sort of freedom and have some sort of life that they can live and not be under oppression. But anyway, that's not the message this morning. This morning, I want to look at, in 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 
For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, well shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel. Now when we're looking at Peter, Peter's talking about judgment beginning at the house of God. As we look at it in the time frame we're looking at here at the end, there has to be a period where judgment will begin in the house of God in the church, John 2, not the individual. And this judgment of the house of God is not related to the judgment of the day of the Lord or the judgment seat of Christ for rewards. Some may want to mix it, but it is not the same. One is pertaining to a period of time. There's a time factor that we're looking at where God has begun that he would begin to deal with uh, his church to bring it to a conclusion. Because the reason the judgment begins in the house of God, he wants to judge and remove everything that offends, everything that commits iniquity, because the time has arrived that he's going to have a bride that is perfect and complete. Now, perfect in the sense of whatever measure you and I may measure in, but the whole bride will measure whatever the perfection is. Perfection means completion. So we're living in a time frame. So when did that judgment of the house of God would begin? There would have to be a period of time where it would be significant, significant if you want to. I don't know if I have one here that's... Uh, All right, I can, uh, you can look at this one here anyway. As we look, what has happened over time, because we're the last generation, that's going to be as far as what the gospel is going to be received. The grace age is going to terminate somewhere up the road. And as we're looking at the time frame that we're living in, this time of the judgment of the house that begins at the house of God has to be married with something else as well. Prior to 1963, all that the Christians knew from the day of Pentecost up to 1963, all that concerning salvation was it was the saving grace of Jesus Christ that was predominant because from the sowing time and sowing down through the ages, even up to 1963, the saving grace of Jesus Christ was the predominant uh, thing that the Lord was projecting on the earth for, for the people down through the grace age. But when it came to 1963 now, God makes a change. He start, now, when I say 1963, I use that as a reference point. There can be an overlapping in it, if you want to. Not everything is abrupt on January the 1st, 1963. But from 1963, then the Spirit of God starts moving on his bride in the terms of what you see in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. It speaks about that how that we have the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy prophetic. So it's now changing from the gospels and the epistle as it's looking towards something that it needs to look at, now more looking at the testimony of, the, the, of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. That's why prophecy, it's not a coincidence that God started with a prophet, that the shout came forth in 1963 that for the first time since 96 AD, that now has God has brought on ground a fresh divine revelation. That's where it started, and it's going to be moving forward. And so therefore, we have moved on in this era of time. So it's not, how can I put it? it shouldn't be unknown to us or, or why we should look at well, what's going on in a sense. 
Why are we so much into the divine revelation of the word of God, more so than the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Remember, he's the one that had it for almost 2,000 years, but it came to 63, and now he's moving with his spirit, moving in a prophetic way, not that we leave those things, please. But now we must, he's put the spirit on the bride, that eagle spirit is now looking forward for things that God wants to reveal because he's bringing things to an end. And because he's bringing things to an end, then judgment begins at the house of God. He's going to start eliminating from the bride, midst of the bride, oh, gradually over time, things that offend, things that commit iniquity. The foolish virgins get separated, and the tares will be separated. By the time the bride arrives to that half-hour silence, there will be no tear in the bride of Jesus Christ. There's a purpose that why he's moving in that direction to remove everything that offends. And you and I are in that time frame, if you want to, that same time frame for 63, I would look at it from, now, people can believe what they want. But I'm just saying, from 1963, that's where judgment really begins at the house of God. Where the purpose is, is to bring a bride to her completion. So as we go down in time, and I know sometimes there's a tendency to hang on to the principal doctrines of Jesus Christ, and just play with the doctrines of the apostles. But I have to say this. I don't know if you realized it or not. By the time 1963 has arrived, every doctrine of the apostle was restored. The principle of Jesus Christ, yes, they were restored with uh, Luther, Wesley, and so forth. But by the time... 1963 came around, God used a prophet to put that all together. Now think about it. From 1963 to 2017, you've had 44 years of those gospels of the apostle being restored and the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Has it perfected somewhat? If we're looking at that's the only means of perfecting the bride, has it done it here in 217? If we're looking at that as the means, uh, the only means of perfecting the bride, I'd have to say you're sadly mistaken. We need it. Yes, that's mainly for the inner man, our outlook with our neighbors and so forth, how do we treat one another. But surely after 44 years, we've had it almost longer than what the early church had. By the time the Apostle Paul, when he came on the scene, as God called him as he seen that light and he fell through the ground so forth, and God put him into his ministry, from that point on, then Paul start, God start using the Apostle Paul to bring in divine, fresh revelation, which we know is the doctrine of the apostles. And as Paul, from that period of time, from that event that took place there till he reaches about 60, 65, depends what the year, till Paul was, was put to death. Then all the doctrines were there, being a, of the apostles, were, at, were revealed and brought on ground. Yes, the apostle John in 96 AD had the book of Revelation, but it was not meant for them. Yes, John wrote some epistles, and, he's, and look at it, here through the time of the Apostle Paul, which was the messenger to the Gentile age, from, let's say, uh, 64 AD when he was put to death, going to 90 AD, that's 30 years. And they had all those doctrines. Yet what had happened, the church started going down a downward slide, didn't it? What caused it to go down a downward slide? You ever think about it? Wonder about it? 
Why did it go down? Well, the Lord knew it would because he would be testing that first church age. But while fresh meat was being brought on ground, that church at Ephesus was growing on an upward scale. When he taught at the school of Tyrannus for three, almost three years, they became the highlight or the model church. But had, yet having all those doctrines, yet in time they started going downhill. And so God allowed no more fresh meat in the rate that he was doing in the days of the Apostle Paul and Peter. Now as, he, as people are taking those things and wanting to live in them, but because there's no fresh meat, there's no desire for fresh meat, they're just staying within those doctrines. And what's happened is pretty well parallels every time there's a move of God. If there's no fresh meat to carry the church on forward, she'll start to dwindle and finally run in circles. Finally, after the first church age ended in 170 AD, a lot of other doctrines were lost. Satan had moved in and brought things down to a place where it took a downward spiral. But it took almost over a thousand years 1,500 years, when God brings now Luther on the scene with fresh meat, that revived. That started a spark and a fire. Then he brought Wesley. That brought a spark and a fire. But as God tests Luther's, his revelation stood firm. Yes, he only had the just shall live by faith. But while that was hot and burning, the people lived right. But it's after his death that they couldn't see no more revelation. They couldn't see Wesley, Zigley, and the, the other reformers. They started to dwindle and die or become a formal church. Now, if that could happen through the Ephesian age, you and I have had the gospel restored since 1963. And that's why God would bring on ground and change now not from uh, sowing or a reaping, uh, sowing that time, it now becomes a harvest season. And from sowing season to a harvest season, you use different equipment. Well, God's not coming down with a big, whatever piece of farm equipment to bring the harvest in, a mowing machine or whatever the case may be, or whatever you want to get your mind. But God was spiritually speaking, he moved from the saving grace of Jesus Christ now into the realm of the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Because it would take fresh meat to keep everything alive and burning as time would go on. And when that prophet came on the scene, he was the beginning of that shout or that message we want to, in the sense of moving forward into new things that God was moving into. And it started with that shout, and it will only end till the seventh seal, when we come to that seventh seal. It has not ended with Brother Branham, nor with Brother Jackson. It's still going on in this hour. But praise the Lord, in that God has now brought forth fresh meat, Yes, we are concerned about the doctrine of the apostles to live right. And if the bride as a whole hasn't been able to reach that point in 44 years with that alone, then somewhere we're not seeing the picture. Yes, that is for the inner man. But I'm here to tell you this morning that fine linen was his revelatory garment that we have to put on, that puts on not just that, but every divine revelation of the word of God to finish that garment before she's going to leave here. And God has been furnishing ever since the days of Brother Branham, Brother Jackson, and even in 2017, God has provided fresh divine meat. And every time a servant brings fresh divine meat 
You're going to get the naysayers. You're going to get those that of opposition. They look at what, what that servant may say in a negative way only to find things that they can use against you. Then that shows me that person that looks that way, it's the spirit of Antichrist that's on him. There can't be two different ways. It's not, well, I remember when I first came into the message. I came in 1974. It didn't go long. There was on ground, the revelation of the Godhead was in first and foremost. I didn't take the attitude, well, I've got to look at it now. I, I might see if I can see it. You don't do it from your intelligence. The spirit that's in you says, there's something to this. There's a draw. First of all, it has to be a spirit, not because, well, I have to use my intelligence to find out what it is. Yes, it must come to an understanding. But the spirit's got to be there to pull you to it. And if, this, if, if there's a spirit pulling you, being hesitant and leery, then that should, that's the spirit of the enemy. That, as we're moving towards that direction. I'm just using an example. All the other things that, that God used that apostle for. The miracle war. The first resurrection is done in three parts. It didn't take long. The parables of Matthew chapter, chapter 13. All those things. How many, did some of you took a year or a month to find out what it was about? You were digging into it because the spirit was pulling you to it. But there were, in those days, spirits that was, well, we're going to look at it, we don't know for sure, and it shows it was another spirit because it was not pulling them to it. The Spirit of God will pull you to truth, to, to fresh meat, not every Sunday, not every week, but God does bring something on ground. And God will restore in three watches till the bride has now come through the edge of that seventh seal being broken. There's things that God has revealed that to me, it my soul rejoices on what God has done. And when I hear trying to mix the judgment seat of Christ for rewards concerning judgment begins at the house of God and putting that all in the same bag, somebody is missing the mark. Something is wrong somewhere. But now, as we look at this morning, we looked at, well, as a review if you want to, we looked at certain scriptures. As we would move on towards the time of that seventh seal is to be broke, we know by revelation it's somewhere after that Ezekiel war. And concern, and there would be a half hour silence. But most of the movement today, look at that move, that half hour silence, they don't even know what the silence is about because Brother Jackson never said it was revelatory silent. They're just guessing, hitting here and there. But we know it's revelatory silent because Jesus is off that mercy seat. And so as we move on, near the time that that seventh seal is going to be broke, there's things that we know today that we didn't know two, three years ago. And what's causing a lot of hair pulling, you'll find it in 2 Timothy, if you want to turn there. Actually, I've got the thing up here anyway, so. In that half hour silence, because getting back just to lay a, a little groundwork,
during this whole grace age. You're going to have wise servants and evil servants. Now, because it says it just addresses wise servant and evil servant, that is a parable, not a detailed shadow. And the servant is referred is used at whatever the servant is, is what the bride member is going to be like. Because he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet reward. He that receives a righteous man in the name of righteous, he receives a righteous reward. So therefore, it typifies the bride as well. In these parables of Matthew chapter uh, 25 chapter, and in Luke chapter 19. Now as we are looking at, as a servant would pass away, take your pick whenever, during that grace age, he goes up to be in glory. He doesn't have his resurrected body. He knows he's saved because he's there. If you're up there now, you know you're saved. But you don't know your reward. Because there's, the scripture is clear. He's appointed a day or when he returns, when he appears, that's when we are going to receive our reward. So that shows that reward is only when that seventh seal is broke. But the judgment seat of Christ, if you want to assume me, judgment begins at the house of God, is in this last generation leading to the seventh seal. And there's no rewards giving there. It's just God taking out the things that shouldn't be in the church. So these are two different things to look at. The judgment that begins at the house of God has nothing to do with the judgment seat of Christ for reward. Period. But now, what happens to the sinner or the, the, the evil spirit or the evil servant? What is that evil servant? He's a tear. And that evil servant, what happens to him? Not that one. Once he gets in, once he dies, he's going to know his, what his end is going to be. He's not going to, oh, oh I, I'm going to suffer. He's in the lower part of the earth in, the par, in hell. He's suffering. But although he's suffering there, his end result or his reward is told to him at the white throne judgment, which he's thrown into the lake of fire. Or in hell, if you want to. Now there's other things that we could bring in. As we get near to the place that the seventh seal is broke. Because Brother Jackson didn't touch it. So I'm trying to prove that it's not what we say here in Moncton. But I don't care what they say or what they're going to do. I'm going to stand with what God gives me. They don't have to listen to here. But anyway, now let's not be being brazen. I have to be true with what the Lord deals with me. And each one of us the same way. I can't put on and say, well, I'm going to discard all those things and just preach something safe so everybody loves everybody. You'll never put a church that way. First of all, why would you need the spirit of, of prophecy? It wouldn't be necessary. So as we get near to the time, of that seventh seal being broken, there's two scriptures Okay, 
it's not in that one. It must be in the other one then. All right. As we come and Jesus is going to peel that seventh seal. Now when you look at that chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, it does not happen everything immediately in the sense when he opens the seal. It doesn't say he's going to open six, wait a while, and then finally open the seventh. That's done over a time frame period of time. He opened six seals in 1963, but there's yet one to be opened. But when he actually does open that seventh seal, up in glory, and you'll find that in Revelation 5 and 9, and they sang a new song, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Now, seals, plural, it shows in that time frame, but we know in 1963 he opened six. The seventh one has not been revealed. But here it's talking about they've been revealed, when the, when the seventh one is revealed. Therefore thou wast slain and redeemed us to God by thy blood and out of every kindred, tongues, and nation. And he has, past tense, made us, not just some, it shows you're in that, that seven seals has to be broke. He made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I heard the voices of many angels, where? Around the throne in heaven. The beasts, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and 1,000 times thousands. So you are now pictured he has opened that seventh seal. There's a great crowd in heaven. They're all saying you're worthy. If you want to, that they're all up there in heaven. And when a loud voice in verse 12 now, that's where some are trying to disprove it. In a loud voice they were singing, the lamb was worthy and deserved to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory, and praise. And here you are in that fifth chapter. The seventh seal is broke. It's in glory. And it's told to Jesus, you are to receive power, wisdom, wealth, Strength. When you look back at the life of Jesus, he says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. But what, if he had it all, why would they tell him he's having, it, he's having more? He had all power in heaven and earth concerning our salvation. He had wisdom when he walked on earth. And I know I'm repeating some things I've said in other messages. But when they came to him, he says, who should we give this coin to, to Caesar or to God? And he says, render to Caesar to Caesar, and render to God what belongs to God. That was wisdom on display. He had wisdom back then, but why does he say that he needs wisdom now? Remember, he's in heaven. He's opened the seventh seal. The grace age is, is, is come to a close. So he's receiving wisdom for what? All these things that he's deserving to receive, he didn't say he had it yet. They're saying in heaven, you are to receive this. Because just ahead of that half hour of silence is the week of, Dan week of Daniel, and then you're in the millennium. And that, wi that power is to rule the millennium with. That wisdom is the wisdom like Solomon to rule the millennium with. Honor, strength, and praises. So it's things that is attributed to him for his kingly rule in the millennium. Now, when we go down to Luke chapter 19. Actually, I should have had the other one. In Luke chapter 19, maybe we can look at it. We'll read this in a minute. Uh, 
And there's some things I didn't mention when I did deal with it that I'm going to deal with this morning. In the 12th verse, he says, And he said, A certain man, nobleman went into a far country. Now that he already had went. He's gone through that far country. To receive for himself a king, a kingdom and to return. Now, you, some may look at that, or you may look at that and say, well, okay, that's when Jesus actually comes. No, it is not, because the following verse identifies this coming. The one in verse 12 is the beginning of that shout, because in verse 13 he says, and he called ten servants. Not twelve, so it's not putting you in the early church, it's putting you here at the end time. And because it's ten servant, it's not in 1900 when, when there was five wise and five foolish in Matthew 25, but when it comes to maturity where things are starting going to be divided. And he called ten servants and delivered to them ten pounds and saying, Occupy till I come. You have two parables that talks about the Lord coming and how he's going to deal with rewards. Matthew reads the... Now, when Jesus was speaking this, Matthew looks at it from a certain angle of it. He sees it from the beginning. As he's ready to go, he gives talents or revelation. And then, of course, he brings it to the great says that it's going to be a reward. But it has its beginning in that first church age. But when Luke records it, he's not looking from the beginning. He's looking from 1963 on down. Well, did Jesus make a mistake, say different things? No, it's what Luke picked up, what Jesus was saying, that pertains to the end time, not to the beginning. Because he says, here in Matthew, he's going to, and here he's returning from something. Now, as we are looking in Luke, he delivered pounds. Luke saw pounds. Matthew saw talents. There's no talent dropped out of heaven. There's no pound dropping out of heaven. It's all revelation. But it's to identify one is concerning mainly dealing with that period in the beginning, and the other one is dealing mainly with the period here at the end time. All right? Now, he delivered those pounds... He says, occupy till I come. Well, first of all, it shows that's from 1963. As he came in a shout, he didn't deliver all the pounds in one day. It started with a prophet. It went on with an apostle. That's the testimony of Jesus Christ in action. And he's also dealing with it in the fivefold ministry. Not with the teacher, not with the evangelist, not with the, but with the apostles in this hour. Not everyone in the church, in the, in the fivefold ministry, is there to bring fresh meat. They are to see the fresh meat that God brings on ground. Now, as that is taking place, as God, now, this would take a process of time, says, occupying those things that are being delivered from you from 1963 till the time that there would be, somewhere later, we're going to read in that parable, in that parable of Luke, that, that seventh seal is going to be broke. But while it is going on, in verse 13, that would be from 1963, and that would be done in, through three watches. Brother Branham, Brother Jackson, and the fivefold ministry. One is just as important as the other. The most important is a prophet. He's the messenger of the age. Without the seals being broken, and it was not broke by him, it was by the Lord Jesus Christ giving it to him. We would be nowhere, even the Brother Jackson wouldn't have went no further, and neither would the fivefold ministry go any further had that beginning not started. But now it's been. And so we're moving here on down. So during that time, 
He's delivering pounds, revelation, in those three stages of the first watch, second watch, and the third watch. When he's delivering those things, you have in verse 14, it represents the evil servant from the days of Brother Branham till almost to the opening of that seventh seal, even in this hour. Well, I don't like you to talk like that. Hey, the tears are all gone, everything's fine, right? My foot. But his servant hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Wow. That's all from 1963 on down, even in this hour, there would be a, Satan would anoint certain individuals, servants, or citizens. Now when it says citizens, I remember a long time ago, long time ago when well, we looked at the word citizen. Oh, that's the Jewish citizens because of Jesus. It is not. It is citizens of what country? What country did the Lord come from? From the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God drops down where the believers are at. The kingdom of God is within you. So when, when truth is coming to the children of God that's in the kingdom of God, here sets those tares hearing the same thing while they're growing, but when they get to maturity, now they start to show their colors. And they hate your revelation. They'll speak evil against it. They'll try to assassinate your charactership. Put you down. That's the ministry of the evil servants. It was in the days of Brother Branham. It's in the days of Brother Jackson was. And it's in this hour as well. But who is it? We're not, it's not to know who it is. But know that it does exist. So he's a citizen when he says, but his citizens hated him. Now, can't be the bride. And sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. That, too, is in the time factor from 1963 till the opening of that seal. But here, what God has opened up, that God did not open up in the days of Brother Branham or Brother Jackson, and now you talk like that and said, Brother Fred's trying to make something of himself. If it's truth, it's going to stand. But if it's air, God will rise that one up to take the thing, blow it to pieces. But I believe it's truth. Because verse 15, now remember in verse 12, he returned over here in a shout. He was delivering something, and that delivery had to take time, and course of time it was delivered during that time factor. But now when that time factor is over, verse 15 says, Then it came to pass when he was returned, and you have to say, Where? If he's up in heaven, did he return to heaven? You don't return. If you're in heaven, you're there. But he says, when he was returned. Return where? Here on the earth. Having received means he's already in possession, been told of the possession of what he's going to receive for his kingdom. Where did he get that? He got it right here. Okay, there. He got the authority in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. 
Revelation 5, verse 12, as you read that fifth chapter, yes, he takes the scroll out of the... It's symbolizing how Jesus is taken, going to get ready to open the scroll and how that we know from what has transpired on the earth, six seals was opened. But there comes a time, to verse 9, where he actually opens the seventh one. He opens them all. It's after he's opened the seventh seal in verse 9 that when you get to verse 12, all of heaven, the angelic host, the 24 elders, everyone that's there some, you're worthy to receive that power. Now when Luke, he, his interest, when Jesus walked on earth, he heard that. That took his interest because he was looking at the end time. So as he's hearing that he's worthy to receive the power, then when you arrive now in Luke chapter 15, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 19, verse 15, it came to pass when he was returned on the earth, having, he's already received it, so he received it in glory in Revelation 5 and 12. But here's the thing. He's received the kingdom, the authority for it. He's not in the kingdom yet. He's in that half hour silence. Then, while on earth, now when it says when he returned, is this the literal Lord Jesus Christ? We know from other things that has been ministered to us in the past through Brother Brown and Brother Jackson. It's the angelic being that's projecting Christ here on earth to you and I. And while that angel's here on earth projecting to you and I, when he's on the earth, he's received the kingdom because the seventh seal is broke. He has come down now in that angelic form. And having received the kingdom, he says, Then, at that time, bring these servants to me to be, see what they've done for their reward. Because that's what the following verses are going to talk about. Is he talking about Servants that are already dead? No, he's talking about a living servant that has come into that half hour silence. Now, if that was the only scripture, I'd have to say, well, Brother Fred, you're out on a limb. But now, let's go to 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's not saying it would be nice. When the apostle takes the effort to say, I charge thee. And I know about your Bible, but that word charge is in bold letters. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall judge? That's not in the time of the judgment of the house of God. Now it's at the judgment seat of Christ. And the reason that judgment seat is in that half hour, because here's the key to it. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. The quick. It's referring to living, breathing, moral peoples on the earth. And who's he going to be judging? Who's the quick in that half hour? It's the fivefold ministry that has walked in that half hour silence. Now, some might have want to take other scriptures and other Bibles and say, well, the quick doesn't really mean that. It means that everybody... Uh, and I'm not thinking, go ahead, play with it. But if you know the scriptures, and there's more than one place that talks about judging the quick and the dead. Now, judging the quick and the dead, who is the dead? That's your deceased bride saints all through the grace age that are up in glory. 
And compared to us, they're a whole lot larger multitude than a few, I shouldn't say few, but whatever bride saint that's on the earth in that half hour silence. And when is this going to take place? Now remember, the angel's on ground in Luke chapter 19. He's bringing those servants, and those servants that are living, they are the quick. But as we see here in 2 Timothy, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing? He's not appearing during the grace age to different ones. Get that out of your mind. There, and then we have to look, what appearing are we talking about here? Well, it can't be the appearing when he comes to, after the week of Daniel, there he's coming to judge the sinners. And the sinners are living before he kills them. So they are not the quick. First of all, not, they don't have the spirit to begin with. The quick in the scripture talks about someone that has got the Spirit of God that is alive. You and I have been quickened by the Spirit of God, aren't we? Well, praise the Lord. Now, when you start looking and dealing with things like this, at the time that he's judging, the quick on the earth is through that angelic being that's projecting Christ. And often wondered why wouldn't the little Lord Jesus Christ come himself? I mean, after all, what were you doing up there in heaven? He's busy judging the deceased bride. That's what he's doing in glory. That's why he sends the angel. Oh, but Brother Jackson said there's a half hour silence and nobody knows what that silence is about. God has revealed it since 2005. Revelatory silence. Here's he's opening up a picture a little further. Remember, that angel has a foot on the land and a foot on the sea. You don't have to go a certain place for this judgment. He'll come to you. He can find you quicker than you go to him. At his appearing. Now, that judgment's going to be done when he's ready to appear. When he comes for his bride, he's not going to wait around. Okay, now, wait a minute. I didn't judge you for your rewards yet. We're going to take some time. So, we'll have to put the, the rapture on hold if we're looking at at his appearing. It means at the time of his appearing, this judgment is already accomplished. It's already accomplished because the dead in Christ is going to rise too. And we that are alive and remain are going to change in the twinkling of an eye in the same moment. In the twinkling of an eye, that's not too far apart. So to be have that change, that meant the judgment for the rewards has been determined in this period of time here. How beautiful. Now here's some of the scripture. As far as the judgment is concerned. In jo I'll just read it and I know time's moving on there. In John 5.22, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward. Now that's just telling you his own reward, according to his own labor. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Therefore judge nothing before its time until the Lord comes. When? Not his physical second coming, but in that half hour silence. Who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of his heart and shall every man have praise for God. Now watch. 
in 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear, no exception, before the judgment seat of Christ. Now to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, this is pertaining to bride and bride only. That everyone receives things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. In Romans 14.10, why dost thou set, oops, sorry, thy, set at not thy brother? For we all shall stand at the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> set thy brother at not. That's those ones in Luke chapter 4, 19, verse 14. They hated, the, they hated him. They didn't want him to rule over. Now, in 2 Timothy 4 and 8, it says, Henceforth there is laid up a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give. Now, when he's talking about a righteous crown, he's talk, not talking about their salvation. He's talking about the reward. And shall give me at that day, not that day, the grace age, at that day when he is judging for the rewards. And not only me, but unto all them that love his appearing. That does not put you in the grace age while that's being judged. That is at a specific day, a specific time. It's not a day of 24 hours, but in a specific period of time, and that's in that half hour that it has to transpire in. And Peter, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, huh, what's that? That's all throughout the grace age. No, it's not. You shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. In 1 Peter 4, 6. Now here's what some might want to twist the gospel with. For this cause the gospel was preached unto them that are dead. Now this is referring to Brother Dr. Jackson has dealt with in the first resurrection, part one, page 19. In case you're, you're too lazy to go find it, it's right there. Now, I mean, he had the right, right revelation on this part here. He says, That preach unto them that are dead, that they might be judged as to men in the flesh. As those. When he went to the lower part of the earth to preach to those that were in prison, he preached to them. He didn't preach to those in the torment part. So those were there. He judged them as if they were men in the flesh. Because the Holy Ghost was not in them, but the Holy Ghost was about them to lead them to walk in whatever law or, or that God required in that day. So they are judged as if they were men living as it would have been in the grace age. And of course, he brought them up. That's the only one he's dealing with. Well, actually, it's right there, so if you want to look at it for yourself. It was in 1991. Acts 10 and 42, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Yes, Brother Branham saw that judgment seat. Everyone's going to appear there. But God not, had not opened it up in that hour. Neither in Brother Jackson. He he, God has shown him that's going to be the, that judgment seat of Christ for a reward. It's a, different than the time for the judgment of the house of God. That would be at a place, and everybody would be in heaven. But when you read Luke, when lo, the Lord had took the wraps off of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he's judging the quick, people on the earth, and the dead. We're not going to be raptured with a mortal body and then we get changed up there. Perish that thought. God never did it that way and he ain't going to do it either. There's a whole, oh, there's a whole lot more that... There's other things I wanted to, to deal with this morning, but it seems like time has, has, has moved on to... A, you can only absorb so much at a time. But this picture, appearing before the judgment seat of Christ, the bride did not know that a year ago. And remember what I said earlier? 
from the Grace Age to 1963, it was a testimony of Jesus Christ. But from then on, it was the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. When he told us to watch, he didn't say watch the fundamental doctrines of the apostles or the doctrines of the apostles. It's to watch for the events or things that God has in his word that he's going to let the bride know as she's going on in time. He said, pray and watch. Why do we need to watch? The Branham people could say, well, we have it all. We know that the seventh seal is going to be broken and, and, and we're going to be in the rapture. We're watching. Yeah, you're watching from a certain standpoint, but your revelation is not complete. The same with the days of Brother Jackson. Oh, we're watching when Brother Jackson has revealed a lot of these things and uh, we just need now for some of these events to take place and we, we, we got to divide, divide the meat that's already been there. No, there's more meat. There's things that God has opened up in this hour that he did not open in the days of Brother Jackson. Sevenfold light. I could name a whole list of things that God has dealt with since 2005. I heard nothing yet that contradicts it. Some try, but only to go a while and it falls to pieces. That don't make me anything, but if it's God's word, then God's word is going to stand. Somewhere there's going to be a servant that's going to preach it like it is. He may not be perfect in everything. None of the servant is Jesus Christ. God allowed Brother Brandon to say some dual statement. He allowed Brother Jackson to look at 2004, and some got all confused about 2004. They were looking at a date rather than the prophetic events. And now we're in this hour. And it's disappointing to see where the resistance is coming from. It's not from the church world or the Branham line. Just like in the days of Brother Branham, it's those that was affected in that hour. In the days of Brother Jackson is the same, was the same. So is it in this hour. But there is a people that's seeing it. When I got a hold of that sermon that Brother Min preached in Alabama, he was on to something. Yes, he's an evangelist. But God can give something that he's brought on ground to an evangelist as well. So praise the Lord. I'm not lifting up the man. But what he spoke there was a warning. Types and shadows is fine. You can minister in that. And that's nothing wrong in doing those things. But if that's all you're going to be in, you're not going anywhere. And by refusing what God brings on ground, you're free to choose, but you're not free from the consequences of your choice. God wants us a bride to be spirit-led, not educated-led. Right? Oh, well, praise the Lord. It's getting bad, 15 minutes over. I don't say that to, to bring things down, but I don't know about you, but if all we've had was the adoption of the apostles, give it another 10 years, and you'll be no better than the, some of the denominational church. They'll bring, they'll bring somebody on. I've heard on the radio how one gets trying to get the people excited about the saving grace of Jesus Christ and all these things. That's wonderful. But they're still back there. We're over here. We're in the eagle age. The eagle is still flying. And I pray to God, God raise others, and I know of others. And if I mention this name, bingo. Now, I know I mentioned Brother Mims. I hope he apologize. I apologize for saying that. There's coming a day.
these innuendos of, well, some say, or this and that, the other thing. God may put the pressure on saying, this is brother so-and-so. This is so-and-so that's doing this, and this is brother so-and-so that's doing that. But you can't do that. Well, Brother Branham did. Brother Jackson did. Look at all the ministers he had to deal with in his day. I pray it don't come to that. But it seems sometimes maybe the only remedy. Because if someone's coming into the message saying, well, some are saying, who's that? It's like create a confusion thing. It's like wherever. Oh, another thing. How do you identify who's with and who's against? The minute they speak identifies where their spirit is. It speaks volume to the true child of God. I don't have to say their name, just listen to them. And when they start throwing digs, nobody knows. Well, it's just your idea. Somebody's got a wrong spirit somewhere. I'm not saying that to expose them, but I mean for the average child of God, when you start hearing things that are putting negative things just to Kill the truth. They're self-identifying themselves. If they say nothing, they're safe. Well, up to a point. Are you hearing me this morning? We're getting near the end. The world's in turmoil. It's almost like the American politics. Sometime for entertainment, I, I listen to that, uh, to CNN. The most trusted news, I say the most biased news. And the people they put on there, doesn't matter what Trump could do, whether he do something right or wrong, they look at it for a negative, trying to assassinate his character. And that same spirit is rolling in the bride as well. Not to that level, but it's trying. Oh, yesterday, because he didn't say firm enough, what not, they branded Trump as everything but a good man. I mean, he, he could have been in a, in a meeting dealing with North Korea, and they, want, they probably want him to drop that to go address this riot. What's more important? <laughs> I'm just saying that. I don't know if that was the case. But a leader can't just drop a, a drop of a hat and do something if he's involved in something for the safety for the nation. And all these naysayers, oh my, they got on, oh, they were just pouring it on. And they bring all these naysayers together. They, they grouped themselves together like, like a clan. <laughs> and they go at it. It makes you sick. <laughs> So sometimes I have to learn, turn the news to Canada, the CBC, or the British news, the BBC. When, when I see CNN and you go to Fox News, the actual Fox News that's in the States, are they talking about the same thing? They're so at each other. There's no reconciling it. Why? Because there's a spirit behind it. And so is it with those that would take a negative view of what God's doing on ground. Like Brother Jackson mentioned in one of his messages. He says, when that servant begins to speak, he don't care whose name, how big it is, or whatever it is, he's going to be speaking it. Not deliberately to hurt someone, but you're not going to get someone... To, re, to look at things, if you're not, if you're just saying, well, could be, well, he's, I uh, better stop. Wow. 
enough is enough. All right, let's just stand this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again. Lord, for the things that you brought in this hour. I know, Lord, you're going to have a bride that's going to come to perfection. That's going to be one voice. And it'll be your voice, Lord, that will be accomplishing this bride to coming to unity. But here the then why, the Lord, you have allowed things to come this way, the way it's going now. Lord, we trust in thee that somehow, Lord, we wish no one to be lost. But Lord, you're the one that knows who is true seed and who you're not. And I just pray, Lord, that you mercy be upon us as we now would go our several ways to our home. I just pray, Lord, that you take care of everything till we come back again. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen. Since I've been long, then we, I'll have you to be dismissed at this time. <laughs>